let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have Dr. Jack Naglieri here, who's a research professor at the University of Virginia, senior research scientist at the Devereux Center for Resilient Children, and emeritus professor of psychology at George Mason University. And he is well known for the past theory of intelligence and its application used in the cognitive assessment system and cognitive assessment system second edition. You can go ahead and, and take it away, Dr. Naglieri. Okay, thank you. Well, hi, everybody. I hope that we can have a conversation today. And I'm going to structure it in some ways by um, talking about SLD eligibility using a pattern of strengths and weaknesses. But um, I really do hope that you'll jump in and ask questions. You can see on this, on this uh, first page that there's my personal email and my website. And I encourage you to take a look at the website. And you can certainly email me. I get emails from people all the time um, from around the country and around the world, people who have used my tests and just wanted to ask a question. And I'm always happy to, to um, answer or work or talk to people about it. So, um, you know, you know I've published a lot of different tests. I'll talk about them as we go through today. Um, here's, again, my website. And uh, there, are, there are plenty of handouts, on longer handouts on this particular topic. I just kind of condensed it a bit for today to get us, kind of get us moving. Um, we, I also have a section on my website with case studies. So you can actually look at the case study and the kind of interventions that were used and the, how the data was interpreted. Also, I have 10-minute solutions, which are short articles that I've written about, for example, dyslexia or SLD, and a bunch of articles and videos and other things. So take advantage of my, of my website. Now, one of the four basic psychological, psychological processes we talk about is simultaneous processing. And what that means is that you look at a whole and you see the interrelationships of the parts. And that's what I'm going to start with you right now. I'm going to teach you something, give you a vision that's a big picture. So here's the big picture for today. Um, I, I think that, and you don't need to read this, but I, I, just listen. I think what we do as school psychologists is it so very important because when you do a comprehensive assessment of a student you will change that student's life and that's not an exaggeration it will make a huge difference in whether that student is likely going to be successful or perhaps not so for me this is a really very, very important task that we have. And we have to take it seriously for a lot of reasons, not just the legal reasons or, you know, the professional standards reasons or the ethical standards reasons, but because we're going to influence a person. And that person will remember you. And if you can help that person remember one thing that helps them function better, that's beautiful. So that's that's the big that's the big picture here. Now, when we talk about our intellectual assessment in particular, what, we, what do we really want from them? Well, of course, we want to be able to practice in a way that's consistent with IDEA regulations, and those are typically reflected in state regulations. But perhaps most importantly, we want to understand why the student fails. This is a critical question. Why is the student in your office? Is there some kind of cognitive explanation or an emotional explanation or an environmental explanation and so on and so forth? Because we really want to understand the academic and cognitive strengths and weaknesses, you know, how they all interact. And also, very importantly, we want to assess children in a fair and equitable manner. Now, 
I'm going to show you evidence today. Not all the evidence, but maybe the highlights of the evidence, because we have limited time. I'm going to show you the evidence that I think very clearly shows that using second generation intelligence tests that measure the way people think to learn is really the way to go. And I think that it's critically important that when we talk about we want to measure students' ability to think, that thinking should be defined based on brain function, like I did with saying simultaneous processing is seeing the whole that's actually related to the occipital parietal part of your brains. Which means then that we would actually have a specific theory. So of, of all the instruments that have ever been made to measure intelligence, mine is the only one that was conceived from the very beginning on the basis of a theory based on the brain. That's really important because once you have a theory, then you know how to interpret the scores that you get. And that's my job. My job is to inform you of exactly how you can interpret my test in a theoretical and as that theoretical perspective is confirmed from a statistical standpoint. So the second edition of my cognitive assessment system is really focused on measuring how well a student can think and how that thinking is related to their academic success and perhaps needs. So that's the big picture. Does that sound interesting? Yep. Yeah. All right, thanks. So let's take a let's take a few steps here. Um, first of all, I sometimes people ask me, you know, how did you get so interested in in learning and instruction as a psychologist and all? And I say, well, I, I actually became interested in how children learn in my first profession, which was not psychology. I actually started off as a professional musician. This is a picture of me in my very first band. I'm the guitar player, by the way. Um, so when I was 17, I was teaching guitar. And you know, in the, in the late 60s, a lot of kids wanted to learn how to play the guitar. And I, I realized that some kids learned really well, and some kids didn't. And I really wanted to understand why. When I went to college, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I really resonated to psychology. And even the neuropsychological part of psychology way back then, because it helped me understand about not only how people learn, but how animals learn and all that kind of stuff. Um, really, that's the, the, that's how I got interested in psychology. And that's how I eventually got interested in building my own intelligence test. Because I really want to understand how people learn and how we can assess that so that we can help them learn better. So um, I'll show you another picture from kind of an old picture. This is from 1984. This is my friend and colleague, J.P. Das. He and I met early 80s. And in 1984, this was our first meeting that we had. We decided that we were going to build a different kind of intelligence test. And we were not going to be constrained by how intelligence was defined in the past. But rather, we were going to build a new way of looking at intelligence on the basis of brain function. Gloria's conceptualization of the three functional units, which we did in 1997, published the first edition. And then in 2018, here we are again. You can see we've got a little bit older in, in, in all those years. But in all those years, we collected a lot of information. And I'll share some of it with you, with, with you today. So here's, I, I want you to pay 
very close attention to the language that's being used here. Here are the four basic psychological processes. Planning. What is that? That's thinking about how you do, and here's the important part, how you do what you decide to do. In other words, there's a problem you have to figure out how to solve it. That's planning related to frontal lobes. Attention, being alert and resisting distractions. That's related to the base of the brain. Simultaneous processing, I already told you. Getting the big picture, seeing how things go together, how things are interrelated, back part of the brain. And successive pro processing, it's about sequencing, it's related to the temporal portions of the brain. So notice what I just did. I just taught you a theory of intelligence using ordinary words and no, some people might call psychobabble. You could explain any of these to an eight-year-old or younger, and I've done that. You don't have to be like super sophisticated in your language and obtuse in your statements to be effective. What you really need to be able to do is communicate with everybody, right? You just learned a new theory of intelligence about being able to pay attention to things, see the big picture, see how things go together, sequencing when necessary, and use and better use all of those and decide how you're going to do what you decide to do. That's it. It's simple. But it's not. It's really beautifully complex in terms of brain function, but it's really simple and very, very powerful. And I'll show you all that as we go through. So for really the best place to go to get more information about this, um, especially as it relates to the, the, the CAS2 instruments, get a look at my essentials of CAS2 assessment book. You can actually um, get a peek at it if you go on my website. I have a preface in the first chapter on my website. You can just read those two chapters and then decide if you want to get the book, the remainder of the book. But I think, actually, after today, you'll have a lot of information to make that decision anyway. But this is my friend and colleague, Tulio Otero. Tulio and I do a lot of work together. Tulio and Mary Marino work with me to create the Spanish version of the cognitive assessment system. And I'm very committed to having tools that work for everybody, especially for children who speak predominantly Spanish. Yeah, and you'll see that as we go through today. Um, okay, so just a little bit of explanation. When I talk about cognitive assessment system second edition, really talking about really several different ways of measuring PASS. Um, the simplest way to do it is to use a rating scale, which is on the left-hand side of this slide. This is actually um, something that teachers use. I actually teach teachers about PASS. My uh, colleague, Kathleen Kreese, and I, she's a teacher of teachers. We uh, do a lot of presentations for the organization Learning in the Brain. And we actually do a week-long seminar where we introduce teachers to PASS. And they say things like, you just changed my whole understanding of learning have a big impact on what I can do now as a teacher. Um, so the teachers can use the rating scale. Now, you as a school psychologist can use the rating scale when you use the regular CAS, you tie them both together, right? So then you see the kind of behaviors that a teacher can observe in the, can observe in the classroom that reflect PASS. And at the same time, you teach teachers what PASS is all about. So there's a lot of really advantages to the, to the um, rating scale. The next one on the list, the CAS2 brief, is a 20-minute, very quick version, four subtests to measure one of each of the four areas. This is good for screening. Um, some people use it like you might use a K-bit or other short uh, measures when you want a quick look. A tier two, some of um, my special ed colleagues 
will use this as a tier two intervention. They're having trouble, the teacher is having trouble. They go to the special ed folks, special ed folks give the cast to brief, and then they say to you, the school psychologist, hey, we got this really low score in successive processing. We really need to bump this up to a tier three and find out what's happening. Probably there's a learning disability here. And then the CAS 2 8 subtest takes you 40 minutes. The CAS 2 12 subtest takes you an hour. The advantage of the 12 subtest is you also get supplementary scales that help you interface with other data you get, like it as an executive function scale, which you can use as it relates to, for example, my comprehensive executive function scale called the CEFI, um, and so on and so forth. So that's those are your options. Um, as far as how you might go about measuring PASS. So the full 12 subtest version and the Spanish edition also full sub full 12 subtests. So um, just keep in mind, when we talk about planning, we're talking about a neurocognitive ability. Now that's similar to things like executive function and metacognition, strategy use, and things like that. Right? Because in psychology we often use different words, but we're really kind of talking about the same thing. So that's why I like to explain this a little bit more. Right? Planning is needed for things like setting goals, making decisions about how you do what you do, but especially predicting the outcome of your goals, as well as other people's outcomes. Impulse control, of course, that's frontal lobes. And in plain English, strategy use that may include retrieval of knowledge. Like I can't do this until I get more information. This is all about problems, and it's really all about how we can use all of our abilities and our knowledge to be successful in general. We measure planning with a test like this one. So. You can see that under the number one is OX and under the two is XX and so on. So we give this task and we explain to the child that they have to put the O's and X's under the appropriate number. And they understand that. But then we say, but you can do it any way you want. And then we look and see that they do the ones first and then the twos. That's a strategy. Very powerful, very simple, very powerful. Um, attention is, as I mentioned, focus and resistance to distraction, um, listening as opposed to hearing. And Stroop is a really good example of how to measure that. Because when you look at this word red, and you have to say yellow, that creates a, co a conflict. And that conflict is how we measure attention. Um, successive processing is all about sequencing anything, whether it's words, whether it's movements, whether it's speech articulation, whether it's remembering a phone number, which we don't really do anymore, because we just pick up our pick up our iPhones and they're all in there, right? But if you ever lose one, you're in trouble. <laughs> right? So uh, all about sequencing. Uh, of course, decoding is all about sequencing. Let a sound correspondence, you know, phonological tasks. You know, sometimes people say to me, well, dyslexic kids, I mean, their problem is, you know, they don't have the phonological skills. And I, I, my opinion is different than that. Uh, they don't have the phonological skills because the success of processing, which is underlying phonological skills, is, is problematic. So phonological test is a symptom. The success of processing score is a cause of dyslexia. So we can measure um, we can measure successive processing easy with recall of numbers in order that you might see or hear, or a couple of other ways that we have in cognitive assessment system. And then, of course, simultaneous, I've, I've already mentioned to you, back of the brain, seeing things as a whole, reading comprehension when the question is, what's the best title for the story? Um, when you when you do geometry, understanding the interrelationships or parts, or chemistry, understanding chemical uh, formations, math word problems, those kinds of things. Um, 
grammatical statements, like put the ball in the basket under the table, things like that. We have a test just like that on the cast. In fact, here it is. Which picture shows a boy behind a girl? That's a simultaneous processing test that's verbal. And we mix a lot of content in the cast. We have a nonverbal simultaneous task, a verbal one, and a memory one. We have a visual successive processing test, an auditory pro successive processing test, and a syntax test of the same process. We vary all the all the four processes have subtests that vary on a number of dimensions. Now, of course, we do online scoring and reporting. And I can tell you now, I haven't really been able to talk about this, but we are working on a digital version now. So sooner the better, but we're working on it. And uh, I think it's going to be really, really good. As I mentioned, the CAS2 brief is just 20 minutes, good for screening, like a tier two, um, and the rating scale. I think whenever you give the CAS, you should give the rating scale. It'll help you communicate with the teacher and learn from the teacher at the same time. All right, so I'm going to pause there. I'm going to talk to you about the pattern of strengths and weaknesses method that I developed. I actually first talked about this in 1997, and then in my first essentials book called the discrepancy consistency method. But I'm going to show you what this is about by showing you a case. This is not my case. This is actually a case that Steve Pfeiffer and I did. Actually, Steve, this is one of Steve Pfeiffer's tests. Do you use any of his work, like the FAR or the FAM? Are you aware of any of Steve Pfeiffer's tests? That looks like a no. You, sh you should be. You really should be. Uh, and, and the reason being is because Steve's understanding of academics is closely tied to PASS. So when you get a weakness in PASS, you can align it to the academic weaknesses. And I'll, I'll uh, talk to you a little bit more about that. But in any case, so let's look at this case of Steve's. So this is Paul, typical kind of problems in reading. Can't remember sequences of steps. Good, remember for, good memory for details. Can't sound out words, poor spelling, poor reading comprehension. Look at his WISC scores and look at his achievement scores. You look at these and you say, well, you know, he's kind of, what would you call him? Some would say slow learner. I actually don't like that term. Um, you know, he's, he's not really very, very low, but he's a little, you know, he's below average, but all of his achievements are basically the same except writing, which is kind of curious. But does he have an ability achievement discrepancy? You know, that method that we, you know, we, we really don't like, but we've been using for a long time. No, no, you don't know what to think. What do you, how do you help the teacher? How do you help him? You don't really know. Well, look what Steve found when he gave the cognitive assessment system. The boy had a 92 in planning average, a 92 in simultaneous, 110 in attention, but a 75 on a successive processing. When we analyze these scores, um, this is actually a spreadsheet that I'll tell you about that you get for free that does all this analysis. But when we analyze it this way, we find he has a strength in attention and a weakness in successive processing, but he's also just pretty darn good at planning and simultaneous. Wow. What a different view of the same student. I mean, think about that. These kind of scores here, these kind of scores here, your view of this person is very different. So when you look at how that, how he did on the phonological index on Steve's test, 75, just like he did on successive processing. When you look at nonsense word decoding, that demands successive processing, also very low. But look, on irregular words, you know, these are the words that you can't sound out. 
phonetically because like the word yacht, you know, you have to just know it, right? Um, he's, he's just fine there because he's using simultaneous processing to see it as a whole. See, now your understanding of the variability of this academic performance change too, because you're looking at him from a different lens as opposed to a WISC lens. And the way that we analyze this, I've rendered in this flow chart here, um, but basically it, it comes down to this. We're going to ask the question, is a PASS score that's lower than the child's average and below 90? So notice I'm using two rules here. There needs to be variability in the four scores, and the lowest score can't be in the average range. And in this case, we certainly have that. So as we work down this here, we see a compute the difference between passing achievement scores. We did that, and we found that the child, that there's consistency between low pass score and low achievement. And I'm going to show you that as rendered next slide. So we have good in planning, good in simultaneous, good in attention, low in successive, significant discrepancy. Discrepancy between good processing and academic failure. But here's the most important part. Consistency between academic failure and cognitive difficulty. That answers the question, why does the student fail? That's the critical question you have to answer before you can even begin to think about what, what to tell the, the student and the teacher and the parent is wrong and what to do about it. You have to answer that question. I can tell you for many years when I used to do what I was taught, you know, the, the, old, the old test that I learned, you get a bill achievement discrepancy, you don't find anything really wrong, you don't know what to tell the teacher, maybe you go into the subtest level and come up with some cutesy little hypotheses, it's just guessing. This is different. You can take this to any due process hearing. Think about that. You go to a due process hearing and you've decided that the child has a learning disability and the attorney says to you, so, you know, what made you think that this boy has a learning disability? And you say, well, the definition of a learning disability is disorder and one or more basic psychological processes with academic failure. He's got it. He's got good scores, so there's variability. He, he's not uniformly low, and he's had adequate instruction. It's not how, and that's not that he's been hasn't had the opportunity to learn. He's had he's, he got good instruction, but he couldn't benefit from the instruction because no one understood really what his weakness was. And you don't need to worry about anything going to a due process hearing with the evidence because you have a test explicitly designed to measure basic psychological processes. And you're not trying to use a test that's not based on the brain to define basic psychological processes. Or just use some subtest that someone called processing for whatever reason that, that might have been. You have a coherent theory behind it. So it's the strength in the argument that you always want. I've done a lot of expert witness testimony, so I never worry. So the nuts and bolts of the comparisons between PASS and all the different achievement tests are out there. Well, you have to do those comparisons with an understanding of the reliability of the difference between the scores. In other words, test them for significance, right? You don't just want to look at them and say, this one looks like it's similar or not. So in my essentials book, I provide the differences that are required for significance when you compare PASS to all the achievement test scores that you could get, possibly get. But it's a pain to do by yourself. So I created these Excel spreadsheets that you can get on my website. You go to my website on the clinician's corner, you choose past score analyzers, and you'll get this list. So here, the past score analyzers, 
for the FAR and the FAM, that's Steve Pfeiffer's a WJ, for the Wyatt 3, the battery, and a KT. And you just click on whatever one you want, and you'll get a spreadsheet like this. And the way that this works, I entered the scores for this boy, 92, 92, 110, and 75. It calculates the differences from the mean, tells you if it's significant or not, and if it's a strength or weakness. And then it tells you here, the scores are discrepant or consistent from each of the four pass scores. And it builds the triangle for you. This triangle is really helpful. <clears throat> and you should use this whenever you talk to anybody about your results. It should be in your report. And it should definitely be in, you should bring that to any eligibility committee meeting because people get it. I mean, it just makes sense. It's clear, it's concise, and it really helps you communicate what you found. So the different tabs here are for different versions, like the, the CAS core battery is eight subtests, the, CA, the CAS extended battery is 12. So different level of subtests, different reliabilities. So the calculations are going to be um, influenced by those different reliabilities. So that's how it works. And the first page gives you instructions. And the last page in, in this document shows you the correspondence between all the different subtests and PASS, like a crosswalk. So successive processing is required for the phonemic awareness subtest on the cat on the FAR, for example. Does that make sense? Does this look like it would be something you'd want to use? Yeah, it really, it, it, you know, it's, these, these are my own tests. I don't want to have to look up all these time numbers either, you know? So that's why I did it. So here we are now. What are you going to do about it? Now, let's just stop for a second. Usually, when you get to intervention, you're not going to have the same kind of things that I'm going to show you next. So here's an intervention protocol. This is also something I developed with my colleague, Kathleen Kreiser. So what's the first step? The first step is help the student understand their past strengths and weaknesses in a very intentional and a very clear and transparent way. How often do we tell the students that we attest what we found? Not very often, but you can now because PASS is not so complicated. I mean, it's just not. It's pretty straightforward. So what that does is that changes the student's mindset about themselves because now they, they're, they're talking to somebody who says you know what i see you i see who you are i know where it's hard for you i know where you're really good and we're gonna use what you're really good at to take care of that those things that are difficult once you change the mindset of that student and I've done this, I've told students, and they say things to me like, oh, I thought I was just stupid, and that's why I couldn't do this stuff, right? When they realize, no, they're not stupid, but they have trouble with one area. Really, maybe it's really bad. Like successive processing, 75, that's bad, right? But you say, you know what? You can do something about that. Because we're going to, you're going to use a strategy. You're going to use your brain. You're going to think smart and use a strategy, and now you're encouraging them to be independent, you're encouraging them to self-advocate, you change a person's life. So how does that work? So we talk to the child about his strengths and weaknesses. We teach things like growth mindset. You know, if you think you can't do it, chances are you're not going to because you're really not going to try, right? I mean, the little engine that could. It's a good message, nothing wrong with that. Um, you, you build on strengths. So we use planning and simultaneous and attention. We use planning and simultaneous strength to support the learning challenges. And we develop, this is, this is, um, this is a little mistake right here. I, I didn't edit this properly. Um, and attention. And we're gonna help the child deal with the issues with successive processing. And what we, the way that we're gonna do that is we're going to first tell the student, think smart and use a plan. 
and you know you could show them a picture of a of a uh, of a brain and talk about the different parts of the brain kids get that you know look at this figure out how to solve problems see how things go together or are all related work with things in sequence focus and resist distraction i mean kids get that so think smart and use a plan each one of these is a solution that you are able to give to a parent, a teacher, and a student, him or herself. These are handouts from my Helping Children Learn book. Oops, didn't mean to go there yet. These handouts are intended for you to, uh, to be shared by you with everybody. So it's not a copyright problem if you copy them and give them away. We have a CD where you can print them out or capture them on a DV, on a PDF, attach them to your report. So for this case, because the child is poor in successful processing, we're going to teach that child and the parents and the teacher about the value of chunking and segmenting. And the best way to do that is to give them a one or two page handout on what is segmenting and what is chunking. And how they could use graphic organizers plans to overcome anxiety because the kid is obviously anxious when they're trying to do anything that goes in order. Because the whole child, you got to remember that whenever a person has a problem, they're probably anxious whenever they're doing that thing they have a problem with, right? As you probably know, the concept of G is really very important in our field, and it really reflects the view of the people who started all this, like Wexler. You know, his, his definition was clearly one that talked about general ability, not multiple abilities, even though his instrument had multiple parts from the very beginning, the verbal and nonverbal, so to speak. Um, and what's really interesting to me is the recent research that uh, people like Gary Canavay and Brian McGill and others have been doing looking at this question of, well, what, what do we know about the amount of variance that is accounted for after G is partial down? And said in a different way, do the multiple scores we get from tests have enough specificity beyond what you get from the full scale that they should be interpreted? That's the question. And this particular study is an interesting one because what they did is they went back to John Carroll's original factor analytic study and they used a different factor analytic methodology a more modern one, one that didn't that John Carroll didn't have at that point. And what they found was that um, the results indicated that anything beyond the general, the overall score, really had very little variance accounted for. And all these different studies here, they all found the same thing whether you look at John Carroll's stuff or the WISC or the differential ability scales or the Stanford Binet or the WISC in Spanish or the, or the WISC in Canada or whatever, they all found the same thing time after time after time after time. This is kind of scary, actually, because we've been taught the opposite. And these, these, um, you know, these colleagues of mine, I've known some of these guys like Gary Canavay and Marley Watkins for 30 or 40 years. And I have a lot of respect for them. They're doing something that's really hard. They're trying to take a, a very strong scientific look at our tools and tell us something we don't want to hear. These are the, this is the evidence study after study after study, 
have shown that our intelligence tests, with one exception, the scales, you know, are not relevant. The G is the only empirically supported score. We should not interpret the different scales as certainly not the subtest level. Only one exception. Yes. So some years ago, I gave Gary Canavay my standardization data. Think about that. I knew what he was finding. I knew what he was doing. And I said to him, look, whatever you find, you find. I just want to know what you find. And if he would have found it was one factor, I, I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> but he didn't. As he said, comparing to all these others, the CAS has more variance accounted for on the scales and all these other tests and that they can be interpreted. So again, this is not research that I did. It's research done by some, some people who I have a lot of respect for. And um, you know, you have to decide what that means to you in terms of your practice. But it's uh, just to let you know, when I was teaching, I told students, never to do subtest analysis, um, not only on my kind of assessment system, but on anything else. So do all that. Now, so if I'm going to say to you, you know, past scales have value, it's fair for you to ask me, well, show me some evidence that they do, right? I mean, why not ask that question? You should never take anybody at, you know, just at face value. You should always ask anybody who presents you any argument, show me the evidence, please. It's not a hostile question. It's an important question that you have to have answered before you start using what that person tells you to do. You need to be scientifically based. So anyway, I've asked this question. Do profiles matter? Now, I didn't ask it at the subtest level because I know that doesn't work. And uh, so I asked it at the scale level a couple of different times. And now the next thing I'm going to show you is a little complicated, so we'll walk through it together. Where did I get these data? From the manuals of all these different tests. So if you go to the WISC-5 manual and the WISC-4 manual, and you say, what do children who have specific learning disability and reading decoding, what does their profile on the scales look like this is what you get. A little low on working memory, but everything, you know, in the mid 80s and all higher. On the WJ, you get this, really everything 90 and above. The KBC, you get basically a flat profile, which honestly, I was not happy about. Because I actually wrote a, the original, a lot of the original KBC with the Kaufman's, and I really liked the test and still do but it just seems to not be working as well as the CAS. I really hope that the KBC would show a similar profile like the CAS, but it doesn't. I called Alan and asked him about it, and I actually worked with the research people at the publisher with these data to figure out if there's any way that it would come out differently, and we couldn't come out with anything. Anyway, we get this profile in the CAS. Does that make sense? It sure does. What, what, what's the problem in reading decoding? Sequencing of sounds, phonological tasks. So this makes perfect sense. Is this enough? No. What do we want to compare it to? How about comparing it to ADHD kids, the ones we often have trouble differentiating? Well, here's what you get. WISC-5 and WISC-4, everything's in the 90s, a familiar profile in the WJ, just higher on the KBC, but not on the CAS. On the CAS, you get low in planning. How does that make sense? I thought ADHD kids have a failure in attention. No, only inattentive type of kids have that profile on the CAS. These are the hyperactive impulsive kids. Impulsive, that's frontal lobe, that's planning. This makes perfect sense. But here's the really interesting piece. When you put them together, look what you get. Here's basically your best 
approach to CHC, Woodcock, basically the same profile. That's unfortunate for, for Woodcock. Um, KBC, just flat and flat. Very different profiles. And with the WISC, what's kind of interesting is first of all, you get low verbal scores. Well, that doesn't surprise anybody really because kids who are low in school, they don't learn much. And the verbal scales, are, I think, they're just achievement tests in, a, in, a, in an IQ test, test kit. Let me say that again. I don't think you should ever use vocabulary to decide how smart somebody is. I don't think you should ever use knowledge, accumulation of knowledge to decide how smart somebody is. Because you know who that disadvantage is. It makes kids look dumb when they're not. That really irritates me. The only reason this so-called working memory scale and whisk is a little low because it has digits span forward in it, which is most like successor processing, but it's so confounded with other things that it's not so extremely low like this. So this tells me, yeah, the G research says well, you can go beyond G with the cast. You know what? It works. It works. By the way, there's a lot of research on other profiles, 10 core profiles on the basic standardization sample, profiles like Kids who have simultaneous processing problems often have different kinds of reading comprehension problems and things like that. There's a lot of good research profiles on the CAS. I encourage you to, to read those. But let's come back to this issue. You know, I like the Saturday Night Live research, you know, weekend update, we're doing a research update here. You know? <laughs> we want to know what's going on, right? Well, let me remind you of something. Standards for Educational Psychological Tests clearly says that if a person has had limited opportunity to learn the content in a test of intelligence, information, similarities, arithmetic, comprehension, or in the WJ phonological task that Kevin McGrew likes so much because it's IG loading, um, that test may be considered unfair if it penalizes students for not knowing the answers, even if the norming data do not demonstrate psychometric test bias. What does that mean? That means that when you look at a test manual and they say, we didn't get any test bias, and they look at all the psychometric ways that bias can be expressed, good methodologies that really came out of a lot of the work of Art Jensen, who I think was in a lot of ways maligned for being a serious scientist. Um, but what it says is that's not enough for you to be comfortable using a test. You have to determine if the test content unfair, unfairly penalizes students. And this is where has theory really comes in. Because with the neurocognitive processing tests that I developed, they don't rely on knowledge. Because what we want to measure is thinking rather than knowing. We want to measure thinking, not knowing. And what's the result? Well, here's the result. Look at these papers published in the journal Intelligence, Applied Neuropsychology. Um, these are major journals that we've published in. All, all this research on race and ethnic differences. Small Hispanic white difference, small studies when you give the, the CAS in English or Spanish. So Tulio administered the CAS, the English version and the Spanish version, in kind of balanced order. We, did, we published two studies on this, and we showed not only do, are the results so remarkably different regardless of what language you gave the test in, decisions that you make about the students over 90% of time are the same decision. Like, did they have a weakness or not, or a strength or not? It was the same, regardless of what language you gave the test in. That's a powerful statement that reflects what we're measuring. Thinking, not knowing. Now, 
How does this compare to other instruments? It's a fair question to ask. The top half, this is from my essentials book. The, the, the yellow shaded at the top. I call these traditional IQ tests. They all basically are, you know, in the same kind of perspective. Basically rely, uh, the origin being the Omni Alpha and the Omni Beta. And they evolve and they've been expanded and modified and all that kind of stuff, but basically the raw materials are very similar. And you get the largest black-white difference on those tests and the smallest on the second generation tests being the KVC and the CAS. The CAS, the smallest difference of all. And all these data come from published papers. It's all documented in my book. I didn't, I didn't, you can go and check all the numbers. You'll see that they're exactly what they are here. Just look at the data. I'm just, I'm just showing you data that's, you know, that's out there. Information that you need to use to make um, good decisions. But just think about it for a second. All the tests that you use, all the tests that you've been taught to use, they have so much achievement in them. Just don't think it's right. Just don't think it's right to use vocabulary or numbers series or concept formation or phonological processing or vocabularies and things and on and on. I just don't think it's right to decide how smart somebody is. Interestingly, there's a court case that agrees with me. This happens to do with gifted kids. The U46 actually was a school district that Tulio Otero worked in for a while. Um, this district is 43% uh, Hispanic, but only 2% of the kids in the gifted program are Hispanic. Sound like there's a problem there? Uh, yeah, right? So Judge Gettleman looked at all the data, brought in all the experts, and concluded that the district actually not only discriminated against the Hispanic students, but violated their rights because what they did was they required all the kids who could get into gifted had to have high scores on verbal and math tests. And interestingly, the district used my Nagliari nonverbal ability test. But because they required, because their logic was an and statement, not an or statement, you had to have a high verbal and a high math and a high this and the high grades and oh yeah that Nagliari test too that's why the kids didn't get in to me that's horrible just think of all the really smart Hispanic kids in that school district who never felt appreciated by the educational system how alienated they must have been I've actually done some research on how many kids are like that out in the US. I don't think I have that slide here, but I'll tell you what it is. Um, if you go on my website and just look at my presentations on the topic of the elephant in the room, I actually did a webinar on this this morning at a, at a gifted conference. Um, if you look at Black, Hispanic, Native American, and mixed race people, students in K to 12 right now, in the US public schools, and you look at how many kids could have been identified and have been, and the difference, the difference is there are 850,000, 850,000 people who should have been identified as gifted and weren't. Because they don't speak English very well, they come from impoverished backgrounds, and on and on and on. That's not right. You read Yoakum and Yerke's original book, on the Mental Tests, they actually say that measuring ability with a nonverbal, a non-knowledge test avoids injustice by reason of unfamiliarity. So I'm not saying anything new. Um, okay, I'm, gonna t I'm just gonna tell you, you don't need verbal tests to have good validity. And you can look at this research paper as a meta-analysis that looked at PASS and found that PASS is more correlated with achievement than traditional measures of intelligence. And I will encourage you to take a look at my intervention research um, on my website, 
where we were able to show how students, in fact, you can help students improve in mathematics on standardized achievement tests, and the effect lasts at least a year just by getting them to better understand how they can use strategies. And I got a lot of research on intervention you should take a look at. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Naglieri. This is this is wonderful. It's an honor and a pleasure to to speak with you. And um, I told the students that you have generously offered your time, even on a future date, if there's a further discussion that we wish to have. So thank you for for being here today. You're welcome. It's a real pleasure. It's nice to meet everybody and see everybody. And you can always be in touch with me on my website or with my Gmail, which you have. I often get people who say, I gave your test, I found this, what do you think? Um, I do that all the time. And I'm happy to come back in at any time and help in any way. So look forward to seeing you all again, or maybe at a, at a, a conference, always come and say hi to me. Thanks everybody, take care now.